and I'm sorry to upset people in Texas, um, it sure looks to me like um, China is going to dominate the low-end robotic space. They're driving the cost of humanoid and non-humanoid robots down to thousands of dollars from ten, twenty thousand dollars. Their hardware, which is derived from their electronic vehicle work, is extraordinary. We in America don't have access to the Chinese、uh, EV cars, but they're phenomenally good at it, and they're getting better and better, and they're doing it the Chinese way, which means it scales. So, ex Google CEO Dr. Eric Schmidt. Just gave another controversial take about the AI and automation race between the U.S. and China. It's so profound that this will define the future of warfare with AI advancements, and the Ukraine war is a perfect example. Let's unwrap the big picture with Eric before we dissect deeper into how AI is already changing real wars. I think the Ukraine war is a very good test bed to try to understand how AI will change war. And、uh, I'm not trying to minimize the horrific nature of the war. I've been in it. I've been on the front lines.、Uh, real wars are much worse than you all think they are. If you've not been in them, it's really horrific.、Um, I think there's there's a couple of principles that I would offer. The first is that there's no place to hide.、Um, that modern sensors see everything. So, for example.、Um, If you're on the front,、uh, which is a horrible place to be, you can only come in and out of your foxholes at dawn and dusk every 12 hours, because those are the only times when you can move without being detected by the、uh, daytime cameras or the infrared nighttime cameras. And the infrared cameras are getting so good now that the visibility at night is very similar to what you need for the day. I mean, it's astounding. Um, so, if there's no place to hide, then why are you building aircraft carriers? The U.S. Army just announced a brand new, huge tank,、uh, which is a sitting dunk, duck for the next generation of drones.、And、by the time the tank is deployed, the drones will be incredibly powerful. You have the same principle of aircraft carriers and so forth.、Um, it's my own view is that the fastest learner wins. What's happening on Ukraine's side is that they're outnumbered three or four to one, and Ukraine is moving. Very very quickly to innovate ahead of the Russians. The Russians are good, but the Ukrainians are better, and that's why the fight is kind of balanced right now. It's it's not a stalemate. It's a tough fight, but Russia has not been able to achieve her objectives,、uh, which in my view is very good.、Um, you know, if you go back to all of this hardware, when you go to the actual front, there's nothing on it. They don't have tanks or armored personnel carriers. All those things that are sitting in warehouses. You can't use them; they're too dangerous to be in. And I think what's going to happen is that the autonomy aspects will make automatic killing machines in war much more likely. And I'm not talking about the robots that you see in movies. I'm talking about the equivalent of drones, whether they're sea drones or air drones, that are highly automated with highly automated kill chains. And I think the final observation, sorry to go on, is that this is integrated in an AI software framework using reinforcement learning, and that integrated software framework with reinforcement learning means that you can have optimal battle plans. My observation of militaries, having spent lots of time with them, is they have thousands of people who consider themselves planners. Why do we need planners when we can have the computer do a better plan than humans can?、Uh, the planners can obviously oversee what the computer is doing. But computers are going to be better at planning and vision, and frankly, killing. Just so you know, reinforcement learning AI is terrifyingly powerful in war. Basically, it works as simply as this diagram. But the scary part is, it doesn't just follow human rules. It learns by simulating millions of battles, discovers strategies no human planner would ever think of, and then executes them at machine speed. And here's a real example from Eric, which sparked from the famous Google AlphaGo Move 37. So I was present when AlphaGo won the first Korean、uh, championship against the human, and I was literally in Korea. And there was a famous move called Move 37, and Go has been a game that's been played for 2,500 years, which made no sense. And I was with the room with the humans, and the human says, "Proof, proof that the game." Is going to lose. The computer is going to、uh, lose to humans because no human would make such a stupid mistake. 
when they re when they reversed engineered the algorithm, the computer had discovered a new move. And this was the first example that I'm aware of in a gaming context of a completely new strategy being invented that was not visible to humans who were real experts in it. So I'm of the opinion that if you have 100 humans who are busy controlling all the drones, and these are smart people and they're well-trained and so forth, my computer using reinforcement algorithms can actually come up with moves that you cannot anticipate and I can beat you. That is my opinion. So my guess is that the key things you need for, for winning a war on a go-forward basis is you're gonna need millions of drones of many different kinds, by the way, not, you know, you think of one type drone, different sizes and power, that the algorithms will run in simulation and they'll learn what combinations to do based on what the enemy is doing. And the, the battle will occur very quickly. So the enemy comes in with a particular force projection and the computer says, ah, the optimal winning algorithm is to do A, B, and C. The humans will watch this and go, holy crap, look at what it just did. Um, and this is equivalent of, of uh, sacrificing your queen in chess. But as a mathematical uh, ability, the goal in war is to increase the probability of winning from 50-50, say, all the way up to 100%. We, we know how to do that algorithmically. Eric is quite confident about the Ukraine war, but China as well as its AI and autonomous power? It's a different story. Well, it's interesting. I was just there. Um, I visited a whole bunch of robotic factories, and, um, and I'm sorry to upset people in Texas. Um, it sure looks to me like um, China is going to dominate the low-end robotic space. They're driving the cost of humanoid and non-humanoid robots down to thousands of dollars from $10,000, $20,000. Their hardware, which is derived from their electronic vehicle work, is extraordinary. We in America don't have access to the Chinese uh, EV cars, but they're phenomenally good at it and they're getting better and better and they're doing it the Chinese way, which means at scale. So my conclusion was that the ideal scenario is Chinese hardware and American software which is geopolitically not possible, but that's the way I would phrase it. On the AI side, and I've written publicly about this, it sure looks to me like China is pursuing a different strategy than the US. The US is, and I'm very excited about this, working toward general intelligence. If you look at the planning gains and the incredible look at whether it's the latest 2.5 Gemini, uh, OpenAI's successor to O3, uh, it just goes on and on. Look at the coding capabilities of Claude. Um, it, it's unbelievable what they're doing. That, and, and by the way, that's at huge cost, right? Hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. You know the story about we're running out of electricity. We need, God knows, uh, I testified in Congress, 92 gigawatts more power and average nuclear power plant is 1.5 gigawatts. You see the problem. China has all the power that it needs. It's built the infrastructure, by the way, using solar largely. Um, and they have all the power they need. They don't have the chips because of chips reserves. And they also don't have the depth of the financial markets to fund $50 billion worth of hardware, at least today. It looks to me like because of all of those factors, they're gonna focus on consumer products and enterprise applications for the rest of the world. I don't think that America will allow those things in. There's a pretty good chance that Chinese software is going to power the majority of the world's, you know, um, human interfaces with computers and business interfaces. Uh, that's of concern. I think it's very important that U.S. technology dominate all of the spaces. I want America to win, and I think we need to win in all of those. I think we're not spending enough time on the more mundane stuff. We're spending as we're spending a good amount of time on the exciting stuff, which is great, we need to spend more time on the mundane stuff as well. Economically, Eric sees a split. The U.S. leads in cutting-edge, very expensive models. China leads in scaled, cheap hardware and may capture massive global market share in day-to-day -day AI applications. But what about Chinese military AI? Um, there's no hint at all. Um, the people I was with were not military. The Chinese military does not welcome me to chat with them. Um, I always, when I visit a Chinese company, I always believe, because of civil-military fusion, 
I'm in one building and I always believe in my mind that there's another building next door, which I'm not allowed into where they do all the military work. So remember in their model, the, the companies, the, the national champions do both military and, and civil stuff together, presumably in different buildings with different classification. So you have to assume that every product that I see, which includes by the way the robotic stuff, there's a military division as well. I did not see them. So it's shrouded in secrecy. Which is understandable because, yeah, it's a state military secret. But Eric also assumed that civilian AI and robotics advances in China are tightly coupled to military programs, even if that part is kept hidden. Unfortunately, the U.S. is not keeping up in this future of warfare. Here's why. Well, the, the U.S. is at the moment well behind in the areas that I'm speaking about. Um, the Secretary of Defense has issued a very important and positive order to get organized around drones. The U.S. spends, I think it's a trillion dollars a year, roughly, in military national security spending. It's, it's on that order. Um, so there's plenty of money in the system. One way to understand the U.S. military is, and thank God we're at peace, is it's sort of a, lar it's sort of a job subsidy program for existing industries. If we're really at war, which hopefully never will occur, if we're really at war, I think you would see our military change very, very quickly. We have plenty of U.S. companies that understand what I'm talking about, uh, many of which are in the room, and they have trouble getting big contracts because that's not how the primes work. The U.S. military does not have very good software capabilities compared to their hardware capabilities. The procurement systems are not organized around these. So again, if it were possible, I would accelerate this transition to offset X, autonomy, and drones. I see no reason why America should give an inch. Um, I want us to, uh, the phrase is, we bow to no one, right? America's dominance in the world is very important to American exceptionalism, to American economy, to freedom, I think America is committed to fighting against tyranny. That's why we fought in World War II. I'm a strong supporter of all of this. I worry that we're still spending 99.9% .9 of the money on stuff that's not very important. Um, another example, for the last 15 years that I've worked on this, when you have a person with a rifle in, in the enemy, they typically use a missile from a jet to, to kill that person. That's, that doesn't make any sense. Um, in the initial war in Ukraine, because, before the Ukrainians had what they have now, they would use million dollar uh, S-300, S-400 missiles to shoot down Shaheds, which cost about $27,000 at the time. Again, the math doesn't work. It's really important in this new world to have defensive systems, which are, by the way, dual use, that you can mass produce at scale what I'd like to see in America is a commitment to large manufacturing capabilities in the United States with stockpiled parts. I, I was talking to some of my general friends and they pointed out that in the China conflict, which again, we hope will never occur, we're gonna also wanna have those kinds of factories in the Philippines, Japan, Korea, you know, our allies as well because of the tyranny of distance, which makes sense to me. It's a, it's a complete rethink of this. Well, you know, our military, uh, these, these are real heroes. I, I, I love working with them. And <clears throat> they have a doctrine of fight tonight. They have enormous courage, much greater courage than I do. We do not have the tools and the systems that they need. We are failing our leaders. Uh, people in this room, part of the reason we're having this meeting is because collectively, I think we all kind of agree with this in philosophy. And so America's strength is innovation. So why are we not uh, applying the same principles of innovation that are in the consumer sector to the military? And it's because of the procurement systems, right? The average time to weapon system is something like 17 years now, right? By then the thing is, is obsolete. Um, I can't remember which of the jets it is, but it has some, it has like a Pentium 4 processor in it and it's still programming. When I was uh, flying, when I was in the Pentagon, I discovered a Burroughs 6600 deep in the bowels somewhere yeah. where people were afraid to turn off. Right? <laughs> the programmers who wrote that are literally dead. Right? So come on, guys. We can do better than this.
And so this part of the conversation, part of what you're trying to do, Gene, is to, to get everyone to talk about this. Um, it seems to me that the way America changes is either from a crisis, which we do not want because it's war, or because we collectively agree that we want to win in a new space. And for all of you, there's enormous revenue here. Now you have this explosion in um, fantastic startups. And I want, them to, I want them to get through the valley of the death. I want the government to have a way of working with them. I want them to know who to call. The, the thought experiment that I used to give is, let's imagine mm -hmm. that I collect all the venture capitalists in the Bay Area in a room for a military procurement venture conversation. Who from the government is going to come and present to them and what is he or she going to say, right? If you can't answer that question, right, then you're not going to win. Now, our venture capital community loves to talk to CEOs and they imagine who the customer are, but this is a single source customer, right? For good reason, by the way, we don't want separate militaries. The military has got to learn how to work with us. And of course, they're very law abiding. The laws have to change to allow for this. And I'm excited for that to occur. I'd like it to occur during my lifetime. To me, it's almost like China and the US are in an AI race, similar to the Cold War arms race. Except this time, instead of the US duping the Soviets into spending themselves into oblivion, developing a tech that won't actually benefit their population while severely neglecting their infrastructure, cost of living, and corruption, China is the one pulling these moves on the US. Seems to me like China just read the playbook on how the last challenger to world hegemony was overcome and is turning it on the current hegemon. But you know, the future is always hard to tell. So stay tuned and thanks for watching.